Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening, Rabbi. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. Good. It was a wonderful uh, Shavuot I had. Oh, yeah? What did you do? Um, uh, I went to the neighbor's house yeah. and I had Ten Commandments in Hebrew. Oh, wow. That's great. Uh -huh. So you have Jewish neighbors? Uh, I do. Fuck you. Okay. Knock down their door. <laughs> yes. Tell them that you're there to learn. Uh, yes. Um, yes. I'm still listening. I'm just going to move around a second. Yeah. That's great. You know, you know the, the, Jew, the, you know, the Jews need to be woken up, you know? Silence, silence is no longer an option. Yeah, there's, um, there's many different um, understandings uh, amongst the Jewish people what to do with the Gentiles. So um, I need a patience <laughs> and understanding. So what are these people like? They're, they're more receptive? They're more... They, um, I think the Torah is for Jewish people. That I, th I think many Jewish people have that understanding um so i think that's where they are okay but um yeah um i think they start understanding that um non-jews wanting to learn uh, torah from jewish people so right. um but it's it's slow process in a way um the chasm is large i feel sometimes hmm uh, can I ask one thing? Um, sure. it, this, this was coming up from um, uh, learning, reading Kabbalah and the Hasidut. Um, I think it says even love your enemy. You treat others, you know, love your fellow, and not just the Jewish people, but everybody, and that's including... Um, the current um, enemies, they are also somebody um, God created, created and they are to be um, brought in to the reality of that is, you know, that they themselves have got creation and they need to be loved and um, they may be doing not right things right now, but um, they are to be gently um taught um but that's something blowing my mind in a way uh, and uh, previously i heard from other jewish rabbis um modern orthodox rabbi um he said love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you which is in christian bible that is not in judaism he said but um, reading up some Kabbalah and Hasidut, it seems to flip. So you even love your enemy. Is that? All right, great question. It says in Pekiavis, uh, having the Talmud of Aaron, you should be of the students of Aaron, the high priest. Aaron. Mm -hmm. Love the creatures and draw them closer to the Torah. So, oh yeah, it's the Brias, the, the Lubavitcher explains, the Brias means the cre literally creations. The way you could, way, what it really means is love those that have no other merit than that they are, than that that they are created beings. So a person whose only merit, everything about him is off, and maybe he's acting improperly and he's doing improper things. He's thinking improper thoughts. He's saying improper things. He's doing improper things. He's the one who has no other merit. Because if, if a person, let's say, smiles at people, and he does nice things. So then he, is, he has advantages. He has some advantage. He gives, a, let's say, he gives a lot of charity or he employs a lot of people or he prays a lot or he understands the unity of God and proclaims the unity of God. All these are great things to do that 
then me and the person is more than just merely a creature. The person, human being that's so far from, from godliness that all you could see in him is that he is, his only claim for your attention is that he is created by God Almighty. Ayyav is a breeze. He, you have to love him and draw him closer to the desire. And drawing him close to the Torah means that you need to let him know that you see that he's created in God Almighty's divine image. You need you need to see your his potential. There's a Rabbi Mayor Greenberg was the, the chief rabbi of Patterson in northern New Jersey, which at the time had a big Jewish population. And one night he was uh, walking home from the synagogue, and the neighborhood. Uh, was deteriorating. Um, there was a lot of kids that were, you know, of youth roaming the streets, and uh, a young black kid comes up to him with a gun. And this rabbi is walking home from Shab from shul, and the the kid robs him at point blank range, and says, "You know, give give, give him all his money or else." So Rabbi Greenberg who was also a Hasid al Rebbe, he looks at him with tremendous compassion and says to him, looking him straight in the eyes with compassion, that you are far better than this. And the kid was moved and he ran away. Now, that shows you how deeply ingrained it has to be in your mind and in your heart, the value of this human being. Because he didn't get into any, well, this kid is, uh, you know, a poor black kid from the, the, the people that are coming into town and, you know, the whole neighborhood is deteriorating and um, this kid is carrying a gun and, um, you know, what, what, what does he have going for him, this kid? What does he have going for him at all? Obviously, he's robbing people at point blank range in the dark of night. And that's not how he saw the kid. He saw the kid as being created in God Almighty's divine image. So the gun didn't make any difference to Abby Greenberg. The gun was just, so to speak, an excuse, an opportunity to have presented itself that they're now forced into a conversation. This kid out of desperation, spiritual desperation, emotional des desperation, perhaps physical desperation for the money, is certainly mental dis desperation, is, is uh, positive, stopping Rabbi Greenberg. And now Rabbi Greenberg is going to convey to him what Rabbi Greenberg really thinks about him. So that's the, that's the real test. The real test is when we're challenged in such a situation, are we able to access what we really think about the person? What is that we're really thinking about that person all along? And this is what Rabbi Greenberg was really thinking about this other human being that was his neighbor, I mean, living in the same town, um, so a neighbor, but also a, a fellow human being. So that's that's what he saw in this person. Now, Ideally, we would that conversation that that you know story would have had a prolonged conversation. That that young man would have said to Rabbi, put away his gun and said, "Rabbi Greenberg, please teach me." But I guess he was overwhelmed with you know shock and his feelings and his this, this what seeing in this rabbi's eyes what he saw in this young kid, and he. His, his only reaction was to flee. But ideally, that would have been part of a longer conversation. In fact, it says by, by um, Rach Lakish, who was a great Torah scholar, that he came into contact with Rabbi Yechanan. Um, and in an effort to do something that was improper. And um, Rabbi Yochanan was able to see that this person who was a thug, 
and a leader of bandits had the potential to learn Torah, and he convinced them in the midst of this ambush that uh, he should learn Torah, and he should, if he would learn Torah and become a Torah scholar, he would give his own sister, Rabbi Yochanan, who was a great, great Torah scholar, would give his own sister to this Reish Lakish as a wife. So, can you see how convinced Rabbi Yochanan was about this greatness of this other person? That he was already making a deal with him to marry his sister to him while the guy was still you know, in the in kind of frozen in place in this middle of this ambush uh, in this conversation. So Rabbi Greenberg similarly saw this human being. That's what he saw. He saw the human being. So the, uh, the story was told to me by his son. I did myself meet Rabbi Greenberg. I don't know if I discussed this story with him. Um, but the son, his son told me the story also, Rabbi. And, you know, the, the, that, that is the story. Meaning to say, it wasn't like a, a you know, a person uh, gets out of a difficult situation and then he goes in under his breath, he says something nasty about the person who, can, you know, tried to rob him and stuff like that. Or Nothing negative, but there's nothing in the way the story was conveyed to me. Nothing negative was thought or said about this kid who who was carrying a weapon uh, and threatening to kill if he didn't get the money one. Now, as it turns out, Greenberg, I think it was on a Friday night, so Robert Greenberg didn't have any money on him. But uh, that is not uh, really the, the main point. The main point is that this this is what the kid's intention was. And who, who knows what he might have done? You know, a lot of times in these situations, they don't believe when someone says they don't have money. So there's really about what is what are you thinking about this person? How are you seeing this person? And that is what's going to come to the forefront in the time of stress. So if you if you're it applies in every situation, you know. It's it's so interesting because people find it very easy to have a list of complaints about people, about how terrible people are. And that thinking is so dangerous because it will swing around and and it will swing around and and strafe everyone around them. You know, it's interesting. I see that uh, when when a couple is happily married and they have little kids, then it's so cute. The baby and the, the diaper didn't get changed on time. And, oh, sweetheart, I understand. You don't have to. You're too tired to change the diaper. And oh, a little diaper rash will go away. If the if the one of the if the spouse one of the spouses is in a mo mood of hostility, and the relationship is not going well, or God forbid, they're with lawyers and in court and stuff like that, that exact same scene is going to be written up in an affidavit by one lawyer presenting to the judge how the other parent is a completely neglectful, neglectful abusive parent because they, the child had a diaper rash and was left unchanged for three hours with a wet diaper. And this is, you know, what kind of negligence is this? So you can see that a hostile mindset towards other people will take something, that, the very same thing, we're not even able to, able to perceive people correctly because the very same thing, which is, so just part of life and you know of course so understandable that one of the parents was you know home alone with the kids and so overwhelmed and tired and you know it was the third diaper in 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 20 minutes and uh that's so understandable all of a sudden when a person's hostile there's no merit to the person there's everything's wrong with them they become just start writing they talk about them as if they're some sort of really like a terrible person so we really have to see that that's is really about our perception. Nothing changed in the person. It just changed in our state of mind. How are we looking at the other person? So do we see the other person as, as a human being who's struggling with whatever they're struggling with? 
it could be just trying to keep up with some of the day-to-day -day activities in life. And it could be someone's caught in some terrible thought process about himself thinking other people are evil and following through with, uh, you know, acts of hostility against other people. Whatever it is, it's still, he's, he's off track. So the answer to your question is the, the concept is, is to be clarified is that when we say love the, you know, that you quote, love thy enemies, we're not, we're not going around um, uh, offering or shouldn't be. So there's some people who whose minds have become twisted enough that they will do this. They'll you know go offer flowers to the people who are machine gunning. Um, uh, the, you know, the, just oh, you know, we're we're, we're not we're not pa Torah is not passivism. On the contrary, the Torah says if someone's coming to kill you, you have to get up and kill them first. You have to judge at the moment in time what is this person going to do. Now, Rabbi Greenberg saw an opportunity to speak to the heart of this young man. There could be a different circumstance if there's a people that are like, you know, really opening fire. And if he had had a uh, weapon with him, it would have been a mitzvah for him to open fire first. If his perception was that it was, uh, there was, that, that, that's what required that, that's what that's what Torah requires. So it's not about love thine enemies in the sense of you know um we're uh just going to let them do whatever they want. It's about that so that so you have to understand what is the other rabbi that you spoke to, what is he responding to, what he he think was meant by that, and so forth. But we have an a, a, a instruction to love the creatures. And draw them close to the Torah. I Meaning, even the people whose only merit is to be a created being, him you have to love, and try to draw him to the Torah, and draw him to the Torah. And as we know, that as we've learned in other learnings that you've participated in, that if it, if it, the words are not coming from the heart, it means there's something. If the words are not going into his heart, they're not coming from my heart, and that means there's something that's not um, soft in my heart. My my heart, I'm not accessing my own heart properly. So. One last thing I'll say on the subject is when we look and see that and we, we take responsibility for what's going on in the world. Say, okay, you have a group of people that are hostile. They're chanting evil slogans and they're shooting missiles and they're killing people and these kind of things. So you could say, oh, they're so terrible. You could also say, well, this is, the, this is the state of man's thinking. If he's not taught the divine principles in the Torah. And whose responsibility is to teach him the divine responsibilities in the Torah? That's me. That's why I'm here in this world. So if he's in this, or he or his friends or his whole country, these people are in a terrible state of, of a low state of mind and of, of spewing hatred and violence and doing terrible things and killing people. The correct way to look at them is, well, they they are they are behaving this way because they were not we did not reach them first with a message of hope now again if the person is insistent on doing that way and he you know refuses to in any way um he's going to insist on his way of being murderous then you might have to kill him first but that's not really where the end is that's not really the end um, goal of God Almighty. If Abraham is praying to God Almighty and arguing with God Almighty to save the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they shouldn't be destroyed. Then your our goal is not really to kill first all the people who want to kill. Our that that might be an act of last resort that the Torah requires, but the Torah is telling us that you should be thinking of every possible way to reach that person well in advance of even coming close to that type of situation. And one, I may always say one last thing, but you just, you have to really, you have to learn to understand what does Mashiach look like? So the Rebbe says that 
those who are our greatest opponents will become the greatest allies of, of the Torah and of, of the Jewish people and of, of promoting the knowledge of God in the world. So what's going to shift is how I look at them. Because when they see me looking at them that way, they're going to be touched and they will realize that there is hope for them, that they are, I'm not writing them off. I'm not holding against them a list of all their crimes and their grudges against them. If, if they, as soon as they see in another human being's eyes that they'll be looked at with compassion as for who they really are, then they will know that there's a door open, that the creator, their creator, has a door open for them. And other human beings are going to accept them. So then it becomes just a matter of time until they return home to who they really are. To that place of tranquility, to, to knowing their creator, to being in right relationship with their fellow human beings. So the weight that that's going to be triggered is because I'm looking at the looking at them that way. And hopefully, if you're spending enough time learning together, and what we're learning here, you will you will start to walk around the streets and walk around the world and look in the newspaper that way and see. You'll be able to see what they really are. It says in the. Um, Lubavitch, the Nusach Siddur, that the first Lubavitch I ever wrote, he said, writes in the, that it's proper to say before the beginning of the prayer service that I accept upon myself the positive commandment to love my fellow as myself. You, in order to connect to God Almighty, you have to be at ease with your fellow human beings. And Reb Mendel Futafas, who was a Chabad Chassid, who was of the previous Lubavitch and the Babacheva, they he was imprisoned in Russia for his activities in increasing Judaism, and Torah and mitzvahs in in Russia. Spent many years in Siberia. He was in a place where no other Jews were around, and there were a lot of like gangsters and criminals and so forth in this uh, situation that he was the, the Siberian exile in this prison that he was in. And he would spend time before davening every day. He would think, if, he would like work up himself into a love. For his fellow. Now, in this particular case, he was focused on thinking about a Jew that he knew and developing a love for his fellow Jew. Um, but the same concept applies. As Rabbi Steif says that the commandment to love your fellow as yourself applies also to every human being. That, and he brings proof from uh, Maram and Lublin in the Gemara, that um, you, this concept of this fabric of existence and this this being able to connect him with other human beings is essential for the existence of the whole human the human enterprise so that's what we that's what we need to be focused on so we have to remember that the the whole purpose of everything we're learning is that we're supposed to see in the creation that there's nothing besides God Almighty. So we can't really claim that we're doing that if we're walking around saying, oh, yeah, except that human being over there. He is so bad that he has no, redeem no, no redeemable aspect. And he is like, blah, 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 blah. Then you're failing to see the godliness in the person, the failing to see the godliness in the entire creation. Actually, very interesting that it's it's an it's inherently a a Christian concept to look at people as being inherently evil. It's so opposite the Torah, makes it Torah the, the what the Torah the truth of the Torah which shudders at the suggestion that people at the Christian suggestion that people are somehow inherently evil or born in sin. These are just such terribly this terribly false ideas that take humanity off track, but it promotes an idea of, of looking at people that, that way, that like they're all, you know, inherently evil, and people are looking at, like, at these comments, people are writing these very fervent Christians, um, seems these ones happen to be Catholics, 
very much, you know, insisting on that the people are evil and that they can only be saved from the evilness by accepting a certain human being to uh, to save them. And um, it's like your whole premise, I write back to you, your whole premise is absolutely false. It's a false idea to say that God Almighty created human beings as inherently evil. But if you look at it, you see that that idea is a, is a root, you know, concept in the, in the enlightenment. Also, the Marxism of the, you know, people are evil for consuming and evil for producing and evil for producing waste, and people are for people breathing is increasing the climate temperature, and um, and then what's the other one? Oh, people are you know inherently evil because they're a certain skin color. All these things are so false and all, they all really flow from the same false idea and we need to teach what the torah has to say the torah says that every single human being is inherently created in god almighty's divine image and no matter how many mistakes a person makes and how many poor choices they make that is really where they are the re the real reality is and that's our job to teach people to see that in themselves. Even though that we have to create a courts of law and we have to implement justice and there has to be uh, consequences for a person doing the wrong things. Nevertheless, the primary purpose of the courts of law is actually to bring the people to the knowledge of God Almighty, to dedicate the people into the, into the knowledge of God Almighty and, to, and into the service of God Almighty. That's the primary purpose of the courts. So having to punish people or give them consequences for their failure to know that or failure to act according to that is actually a sign of the failure of the court to dedicate people properly into the service of God Almighty. Right. So, you know, you taught right here that the, the Christianity is manipulated version of the Torah by the pagan Roman Empire. Empire one would not know what sin is with Pachata without Torah. But the fact of it is, that, you know, People like to say, well, Christianity is this, and it's, it was really on this track, and then it was influenced by that. So it's really a lot of conjecture as to what it's, um, what exactly is the cause of the falsehoods. But the, the right from the very beginning of Christianity, the, the refusal, the actual really uh, repudiation of the sages, of those who lovingly transmit along with the entire Jewish people the Torah from generation to generation, is a fatal flaw right from the beginning, be, even before any adulteration with paganism and all kinds of other things. So the person has to be very careful with these ideas. Oh, they're going to go back to the true, pure Christianity that somehow, you know, uh, is aligned with the Torah. It, it simply isn't the case. If If it's if it was aligned with the Torah, then it wouldn't be called or be or have any separate teachings. It would be, it, it's, if it was aligned with the Torah, it would be something that's aligned with the Torah is Torah. So once it, it's, it's forbidden for any human being to create a new religion, religious beliefs, religious practices, and so forth, because those are denying the authenticity of what's been transmitted from, from man to man, from Adam to to Seth and to Hanoch and to Noach and Shem Ve'ever, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and down through the tribes and to Moses, our teacher, and so forth. Um, the person that come along and say, oh, they have a different way to present it, or a different way to assimilate it, or a different way to explain it, or they're calling it this or that. It's already, by definition, false. Because it's taking everybody away from the absolute simplicity and the absolute accessibility of, of the truth. The Torah is saying that the truth is absolutely accessible to every human being with no preconditions. A relationship with God Almighty is absolutely accept, accept, uh, accessible to every single human being with no preconditions. Returning to God Almighty is absolutely accessible to every single human being with no preconditions. So if anyone comes along and says, oh, they've come up with it, this person or this style, it has to be through this, or it has to be this formula, it has to be this 
this cup of this water or this thing or this wine or this whatever, all these kind of things and say this is the only way that it's possible even if it's not pagan even if it doesn't involve into idolatry if if it was to be such a thing it's still falsehood because a person is limiting the unlimited relationship that's available to every single human being with god almighty once you start defining it and attaching strings and so forth, then you are you are taking into falsehood. And we learn together the Rambam that he says that every single human being has access to be holy of holies. If he dedicates his life to the service of God Almighty like the tribe of Levi, and he throws off all the calculations of man, and he just is interested in knowing God Almighty and 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 spreading the knowledge of God Almighty, and that's all. So that's called Torah. Once you add a different label to it, or put a different figurehead to it, or say it's through whatever some other organization, whatever it is, it's automatically, by definition, false. Because you notice that the Rambam does not say that you have to in order to get this this level of dedication to God Almighty that you have to join any membership, you have to pay any you know, membership dues, you have to... Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't say anything. He, he says, you, if your heart is, is dedicated and you're going to obviously do the right things that God Almighty's commands as a result of that. We're not talking about the heart as a person has a heart that's, uh, you know, his actions are not in line with that. We're talking about the, there's a whole package, but the whole package is available for every single human being to come and take it free of charge. Even at rabbismith.org, we say, okay, we encourage people to tie the dollar a day. So we, the prophecy of Zechariah 823, that 10 from among the nations are going to come and grab the, the fringes, the tzitzis of the Jew and say, we know the Lord is with you. Teach us to take us with you. So that's a prophecy. And what it's saying is that the, the Jew who's been sitting for these thousands of years studying the Torah and immersed in it and, and, and is fluent with it, a human being that's first waking up to realize that he is, he, this is where the truth is, that this person is carrying the truth. It's not in a book over there. It's not in a faraway land. It's not in a building somewhere. It's, there's a human being who's the carrier of this from generation to generation. So 10 from among the nations. Uh, ten from among the languages of the nations are going to grab the tzitzis. So that's um, ten times seventy nations, seventy general nations, seventy general languages. Seven hundred times four is uh, four tzitzis, four corners is two thousand eight hundred. That that okay? You you you're gonna we're gonna go learn. But it's not, it's not that, that uh, there's a requirement, you know, it's like in the sense that if you want to get the authentic, if the authentic knowledge of God, then learn with someone who has been, has, has stayed true and unadulterated and without any tainting the knowledge of, of what God's revelation has been to humanity since the beginning of time. So now, now you're these, these 10 men from among the 70 nations, this 2,800 men are, are, realizing that they've been so to speak distracted for thousands of years their ancestors were distracted while the jew was learning Torah, and he's going to be like okay and let's go to somebody who who is immersed in this and fluent with this so they're grabbing his stitches so that's a that's a practical that's a practical application of it and then there's a practical application which says okay well if if you we, we uh, you can't I can't teach. No rabbi could charge money for teaching Torah. But just as a practical suggestion, if you want, if a rabbi is going to be available to serve 2,800 men, to, heads of households, which is, you know, could be 20, 30,000 human beings uh, with, with, uh, with enough kids in each one of those families, a wife and enough kids, then, then each one is going to, you know, express gratitude by helping free up that rabbi from having to spend any time doing anything else when he could be immersing himself in the divine knowledge of the divine and, and god almighty's divine wisdom and sharing that with these 2800 men and their families so it's just a practical 
um, is a, just a practical way to propel the world into a state where we're all going to be learning Torah all the time. The entire occupation of the world is going to be to know Torah. But even there, it's not about uh, that this is a, 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 a uh, ultimate requirement because it says that when Mashiach is going to come, you won't even need a teacher anymore. Every, the whole world is just going to know God. So we're talking about the, if you in the intermediate stage, so to speak, who who knows God Almighty? Who's been studying God Almighty? Who's been carrying the teachings of Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, is the Jewish people. So go to them for the answers. That's what the prophet's saying in Zechariah 823. But there's going to come a stage where the, the knowledge of godliness is going to be just like open to our fleshy eyes. We're just going to see it. Now, the Jewish people, having already spent all this time immersed in it and fluent with it, will continue to, to gain in the infinite wisdom. We'll, we'll have greater and greater insights, as will the non-Jewish people. And, and it's like the Rambam says, the Jewish people only want Hamim Mashiach not to be able to be uh, superior to anybody else, but rather to have no distractions and the sole ability to just immerse themselves um, in the knowledge of God Almighty. So that's just going to go from, from just infinite infinite levels of insight and be and be, be wise. The wisdom of this wisdom of people who devote themselves to open them themselves and devote themselves to receiving this divine wisdom are going to be able to share that with every single human being. But every single human is going to also have access to infinite levels of divine wisdom. So we see that the Torahs and the, the way God Almighty has told us in the Torah and told us through the prophets of what it's going to look like, what the end result of all this creation is going to be, is the ultimate decentralization of human knowledge. It's the uh, of, of human access to divine knowledge, I should say. Like it's, it's ultimate decentralization. Everyone has access. In fact, that everyone's going to become a wellspring then they themselves, every human being, Jews and non-Jews, can become wellsprings, an unstoppable, unending flow of wellspring of divine wisdom. So that's the truth. Anyone who comes along and tries to tell you anything else which is what all anything that calls itself a religion or a belief system is is coming to tell you something else. They're telling you, it's, oh, you know, they've got a they've got a structure to this knowledge. They've got a, a key to the access to this. They've got some sort of um, you know formula. Or it has to be through this person or whatever it is. Even if it had no traces of idolatry, which is of course these other religions are full of idolatry um, or a combination of full of idolatry and or a denial of this transmission of this divine wisdom from generation to generation which is carried in the Torah then then they're they're robbing humanity people that teach the, these type of false ideas that uh, things are not accessible and you have to go through certain formulas and so forth and try to restrict mankind's access to create a a like monopoly on the truth. They're, they're leading humanity astray. And that's why the Ramam says that there's no greater um, stumbling block to, to the world than these those religions. And when Mashi the time's coming up to Mashiach, people are going to recognize that their forefathers, you know, taught them falsehoods. And people are going to come to see what the truth is. And they're going to be eager to learn. And they're going to say, well, who knows? Who knows this? Well, this, this Jew down the block has been learning. He learned from his father. His father learned from his father. And he learned from his father all the way back 3,335 years to the giving of the Torah. And then that continued an uninterrupted chain from the 2,448 years before then. So that, that's where to learn from. But that is something that's accessible to every single human being. And that's why when God Almighty gave the Torah on Mount Sinai, we just 
finished, we celebrated Shavuot last week. It was given in public. The words God Almighty's utterances were in 70 languages. Because even though the Jewish people are have this inheritance of this responsibility to carry the Torah in the world and make sure it doesn't get in any way modified, nothing should be added or subtracted to it. But it's really, it's a message that everyone has to hear, all the parts that are relevant to every single human being. But it's not that the, the Jew has a monopoly on it, it's just meant for the Jew. Then, that, then it should have been given in, you know, like a closed auditorium. And God Almighty could have said, like he said to, he said to you know, the, the, some people have these uh, traditions in different religions, you know, their, their prophet or their leader had a certain revelation in a cave where they had a revelation in a room and whatever. Something came to that person who woke up one morning, he had a whole revelation, he wrote a book. And private revelation, he then he creates his students and his students then go and missionize and preach to the rest of the world. So if God wanted to do that on a grand scale with the whole Jewish people, then he could have taken all the Jews, just the Jewish people. He could have made like, you know, a, a uh, closed dome stadium of some sort. And he could have had all, you know, six million people in there. And he could have said, okay, I got a message. It's just for you. Let's make sure the windows are closed. Sound doesn't leak out. This is just a message for the Jewish people. Um, and we're going to make sure that no one else, they're going to just make, you know, don't, don't let anyone else hear this. This is the message for the Jewish people. Okay, that would have been more impressive than having it uh, heard just by one person. Have at least six million witnesses to it and uh, something verifiable. But it goes way beyond that. There was no closed arena. There were millions of other human beings there that attached themselves to the Jewish people. The Torah was given, God Almighty spoke simultaneously in 70 languages. He commanded Moses to write the Torah in 70 languages. The, the Ten Commandments were set on Mount Sinai included not only the, six, the 613 commandments, but the seven general overarching principles for all humanity that include hundreds of commandments, seven general commandments, 30 more, more detailed commandments, then from that hundreds of details and, and thousands and unlimited details. And all that's that's it's a, it's like a, the whole world heard the Torah, and it's meant to hear the Torah. It was said in a public way. So that's the that's what God Almighty's intention is: just complete accessibility to every single human being, anywhere, anytime. So that's what that's what we're here for. What we're here for is to bring this to completion. So, you know, for thousands of years, the Jewish people have been chased around with bats by different people that didn't like what the morality of what the Jewish people were teaching. And um, and so the, the Jew had to, you know, teach, teach his children quietly. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, limitations. And, you know, the, the, the Jewish people in every generation had influence on the, the non-Jews, some more widespread than and other times less widespread always had an uplifting influence and then now the Rebbe says the time has come that this has just there is nothing holding the world back from experiencing this from from corner to corner from every aspect of the world for every single human being so that's what we must do so i'll put up i want that well you're here in the right place because this is what god almighty is is teaching us teaching us and he's sending us this message he's, he's sending us this message every day again and again all we have to do is listen so i think we've encapsulated the torah portion you know the the torah portion president nasi comes in the heels of harshas uh, uh, shavuos and we don't have the time right now to go through every detail but you can listen to last last week's um learning on this last year's um so the turn this week's Torah portion has the incident where the um the parsha the, the tar, por, portion of the turn chapter 5 verse 11 speaks about the uh, 
situation of a suspected adulteress. And you can read here all the details, but this is a situation where a, a woman is, is forbidden. Married woman, both a Jewish woman and a non-Jewish woman who's married, she's forbidden to be with a man who's not her husband. And so a question was asked over here by one of our regular participants. What, if anything, does the account of the site to tell us about uh, the non-Jews? I also remember that the Divine Code by Ask No International, English translation of the Shev Mitzvah Hashem by Rabbi Vaisha Wiener, says that non-Jews are also not obligated to avoid marrying someone he has already divorced who then married another man and later came back to him. So what is God Almighty's will in all of this? What is the ideal? And is it different for Jews and non-Jews at all? Then why? So the answer is as follows. That there is no difference between the obligation and the, um, the highest form of immorality among the, the capital crimes for sexual immorality is for a woman to be an adulteress. That applies whether it's a Jewish woman or a non-Jewish woman. There's no distinction in terms of this is something that's forbidden. It's something that is destructive of civilization. It's destructive of the, the holiness of the family unit, meaning to say that God Almighty created nations, and those nations are based on families. Families must be powerfully intact. And resistance to the outside and all the energy needs to be directed inwards for them to be able to have a powerful ability to direct their energy outwards afterwards to affect the world around them. So that is the first fundamental. And that needs to be clear. And that needs to be brought up in every um, in every situation, in every part of uh, of dedicating people to the service of God Almighty. Right? Moshe Entelman writes in his very important book to eliminate the opiate that the natural character of a woman is to be modest. That is something that a woman is naturally modest. He, she naturally covers herself. She naturally does not seek to be um, make herself available to multiple men and to involve herself in things that are promiscuous and so forth. That's just the natural way that God Almighty created a woman and left, so to speak, to her own devices. That's the way that she's going to conduct herself. But the Amalek, in trying to destroy that innate connection to the natural goodness of what it means to be a woman, in order to spread chaos in society, works to promote promiscuity, to open women's eyes and idea minds to the idea that adultery, God forbid, is okay, and all kinds of different activities are are somehow okay. In order to just and they start with all kinds of different suggestions and then stories and of course all the movies about affairs and all this kind of stuff that becomes like it's just part of the way things are and then person's very much open to suggestion now why is this that why the why are the women the target the women are the target because they're they're the ones that have to be so to speak unwound men are much more all over the place a man really needs to to focus himself and to focus his thinking and to ignore extraneous thoughts um, that if he wasn't to ignore them, he would find them very interesting. And the more he would think about them, the more he'd be inclined to go after whatever he's thinking. So a man has to really work on saying, I'm not going to think about this. But a woman, her innate state is that she's re actually repulsed by all these suggestions. She's repulsed by lewd ideas. And so, in, so you actually kind of have a, a, um, a, 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 an imbalance over here in a certain sense. And, and a, the man doesn't need too much to get him, to him off track. A woman, however, she doesn't want to go off track. She wants to stay loyal to the marriage. She wants to stay modest. She, well, that's, that's her natural tendency. 
So through a whole campaign over the last, uh, particularly really, really mounting since the time of the Enlightenment, to promote promiscuity, to promote um, the the whole bohemian lifestyle and the Paris night, you know, the Paris theaters and the Paris coffee shops, and all this kind of very, very promiscuous, very to infiltrate into um, culture, this idea of immorality and promiscuity, so that it becomes something that will erode that woman's natural, uh, as it says, the woman is the foundation of the home. She is the, because she's the foundation of the home, she's the foundation of civilization. So this is something that is, um, it's an actual campaign. It's not like, nothing changed in the nature of women. It's just that if you're given enough suggestion that something is okay or interesting or everyone's doing it anyways, all these kind of things, people will just eventually start to adopt that as if it's normal. So that's that's a propaganda campaign through the schooling systems, through the... Um, through the media, through the entertainment, through the books. And this is going back, you know, people are all worked up today with the education in the in the um in the uh, the education in today's schools, you know, with what the kids are being taught in the schools and the books and stuff like that. And they want to say these books shouldn't be read by young kids. So first of all, you have to read let's look at really what's going on. First of all, there there's a combat zone on the little kids, but already the immoral, the immoral um, material and anti-Torah material, anti-divine image material is already, everyone's accepting that it's okay for teenagers to be exposed to that and adults to be exposed to that. So that's already a terrible defeat of the message that every single human being has a purpose in this world to use his creative energy to bring more good human beings into the world. That's number one. Number two is, People are not realizing, not cognizant that the what you're seeing now in the story hours and the parades and all this kind of stuff is merely the end, not quite yet the end manifestation. There's much more that they have in mind, but uh, and prevalence of it and so forth and, and, and making it part of people's whole life activity, God forbid. But from the 1850s and earlier, there were already women writing books, which all promoted these ideas of these, you know, there was all these uh, affairs and all kinds of stuff like that. English books, which are required reading in high schools. So the immorality is going back. It's not, it's not something that happened in the, in the last, you know, people say, oh, in, you know, the election in 2020 or 2019, that's, you know, things went downhill from there. The person that says that, just doesn't understand what the what's going on over here. This is hundreds of years of propaganda to demoralize and to remove the moral fabric from from or maybe remove people's ability to stay connected to their own moral fabric. That's what's going on. So, if you want to straighten out your morality, you have to be strong at removing from influences in life, and especially when you take a book and say that a teenager should read this, and this uh, book in the 1850s is somehow, you know, all oh, this is good literature. You'll notice in the high schools, they don't read the good literature by the, um, the, the uh, people who are calling for a moral revival, people to be, uh, have, moral principles to stay away from any immorality that's not required reading in high schools or colleges or anywhere even though it's written in the same excellent english with the same wonderful grammar and the same wonderful use of pronouns and and conjunctives or whatever not conjunctive whatever you want to call it prepositions all these things are model language in the in the writings of those that rejected these novels and said they were destroying the morals of the women of that time. Well, that's the intention. The intention is to erode the morality of the population. And that's why the English teachers and the principals that they, they like this material because it's it's uh, 
it's it's fascinating it's titillating it's intriguing it's dramatic but it's opening the mind to all these kind of weird type of behaviors and there's immorality and murder and theft and all kinds of strange things going on in these novels which then um, as that becomes the accepted then the next thing the next frontier is is broached the next frontier and the boundaries are pushed further and further until you bring about the complete elimination of any sense of morality at all so so if you're really honest you wouldn't be spending your time um protesting i mean the, the kid shouldn't be reading the books about this uh you know type of terrible things that are being promoted today but they shouldn't be reading the books from the 1850s either and unfortunately there are great distress this type of reading has infiltrated itself into even the most some of the most religious schools jewish schools in america where english is is taught and uh where they have english subjects they read the girls read these books it's really bizarre actually now we're talking about it because they they say oh it's okay because the boys don't read the books the boys would be problematic remember the boys uh we wouldn't let the boys read the book because if we let the boy read a book about a boy and a girl uh, a, bo a yeshiva boy would read a book about a boy and a girl um going on a walk together or kissing that would cause him to have thoughts that would lead him you know off track in terms of being able to direct his energy in life oh so him it's for that's not allowed reading for him but for the girls it's mandatory do you understand the absolute victory for the enlightenment in that in that move it's the women who are the foundation of the homes it's the women who are being opened up to all these ideas and even if you'll say to me well listen she she grew up in a religious family and she's religious and she would never do any of these things but it creates a mindset of this is like the world and this is part of acceptability and this is to be expected and so forth and now it's been taken much worse with all kinds of uh jewish novels that promote all kinds of for teenagers all kinds of crazy stories so you could see how in even a, a religious jewish institution religious torah institution they're actually once they get the once they agree to the idea that there should be secular studies at all and it should be especially serious for the girls because it's going to be less harmful than the girls then they're being bombarded with all this terrible terrible influences which were written for the very purpose of demoralizing the people and the principal and the english principal is going to object and say oh you know uh, but, but it's uh, how do you it's just a mere illusion an allusion to an affair it's a mere allusion to a child board of word of wedlock it's just a well because that's how the writers in the 1850s had to communicate it in order that it shouldn't be you know outright prohibited for everyone to read instead they wrote it in illusory ways which are titillating enough for the people to allow themselves to read it without feeling that they were violating any real um boundaries of morality and this is what's required reading in these schools to our great distress may god save us so it shows us how clever the enlightenment is how they can they can actually twist people's minds that religious jewish people would insist that it be mandatory reading for the girls but it's forbidden for the boys no it should be forbidden for the girls because they're the whole continuation of the the jewish people they're the continuation of the whole tradition meaning to say the boys will you know kind of meander in and out of of the correct path and if they get off track they'll eventually come back but what's going to bring them back on track when there's a woman that is insisting on the highest standards of thought speech and action so on the contrary the women the, the the sanctity of what's going into a girl's mind has to be protected even more than what's going into the boy's mind not that they should be i'm not advocating they should be exposed to it but it's it's even more 
fundamental that the girls are not exposed to this. So this leads us back to the story of the Saita, because the Saita is about a woman who is pushing the lines of isolated conduct, isolated time with a man who's not her husband. She's being flirtatious, and he's jealous. The husband's jealous, and he's warning her. And once he warns her, and she does this anyways, and witnesses see, don't see her in acts of intimacy with this other man, but they see her secluded. And then she's brought up on these charges that she may have been adulterous, and then she takes an oath that she wasn't, and is given a special um, uh, combination of, of waters and so forth. And, and the, there's a, a scroll that God Almighty's name is on, and it's erased, and in order to test her, and she's put through this test to see, to ingesting this, substance is liquid to to um see if you know she passes the test or not and if she was lying in her oath and she would become she would die and if she from the from this drink and otherwise if she um was telling the truth and she had been faithful all along she would be um, you know brought to renewed uh vigor and the relationship between the husband and wife would be uh, restored excuse me if she wasn't able to have children before she would then have be able to have children so Good things could come out of this terrible situation, but it's a terrible situation. Why was she alone with this man? So first of all, we don't have the time to get into all the details right now, but you have to know applying to every single human being is prohibitions against a man being alone with a woman who's not his wife. Be alone with his daughter, his granddaughter, his mother, his sisters, but even still a person has to take proper um, passions based on the ages and so forth. But particularly with a woman that's not his wife and he cannot be alone with him. And there's many, many different important uh, rules, which we should probably learn together sometime. But these are all meant to prevent us from the, the normal course of, um, of reality, which is that if a man and a woman are left in a secluded place, the, that that seclusion itself creates a chemistry in a relationship, which will um, incite jealousy, which will incite connection between them, and which will lead to um conduct which is forbidden so to answer the question of whether or not this applies to non-jews we have to then understand what are we what is going on over here absolutely yes it applies to non-jews that a woman should not be a, a with a man that's not her husband number two is she should not be flirting with a man who's not her husband number three is she not should not she should not be secluded with a man who's not her husband the process that's described in the the Seita, about the Seita in this this woman who is suspected adulteress. Um, that process is not a of, of testing her, which is basically what that process is. If she was witnessed to be um, uh, by by witnesses that she was isolated uh, after her husband's warning, that's not a process. That that's a process that specifically speaks to the Jewish people. The beginning of this uh, section over here. In uh, chapter five, verse eleven, speak to the uh, ch chapter twelve, speak to the children of Israel, and so that that process is itself um, kind of that clarification process in this specific circumstance is uh, something that applies to the Jewish people. However, the underlying forbidden co conduct that she should not be involved in this in the first place is something that is um, applies to every single human being. And um, while it is, um, there's a slight difference. We say over here that the, the questioner asked, what about the fact that if a Jewish man divorces his wife and then she remarries another man, he is forbidden to remarry her. So she, A marries, Mr. A marries Mrs. A, and uh, then they get divorced. Mrs. A then goes up and marries Mr. B. Then Mr. B dies or divorces her, and then Mrs. A is still now. He, she, Mr. A wants to remarry her. He cannot. And this is interesting. It was actually a practice. Um, I, I think it was about Cicero that uh, he was married to a, a woman, and an older colleague of his said that he very much, um, you know, uh, appreciated Cicero's wife. Wouldn't Cicero? please divorce her and allow her to marry this older friend, which I believe happened. I could double check it with Cicero. 
And uh, then after that older man died, then he remarried his wife. So that's something that would be forbidden for a Jewish man to do in the Torah. That's a specific um, prohibition. Cannot remarry uh, his divorcee. Although he, could, he he's, it's a mitzvah, it's a, it's a positive commandment to remarry the woman that he divorced. But once she marries another man, it's forbidden for him to remarry her. However, that prohibition does not apply to a non-Jew if she does marry another man and then come back to her husband. Her first husband wants to remarry her first husband. That's permissible for a non-Jew. However, that's not taking anything away from the severity of the um, prohibition of immorality. And um, it's something that should not be taken as license to, you know, um, go shopping around. God forbid. That's not what the intention of it is um, at all. Some of it's forbidden. And licentiousness and immorality and prostitution, all these things are forbidden for non-Jews also. So um, this is something that uh, is, is really critical to understand. It's critical for us to strengthen these, this understanding. We have to get out the message there because we are speaking into the stormy waters and the stormy wind of the enlightenment of a Malik coming to demoralize everybody and to make it sound like the one who's saying, oh, you know, you should just be one mar man married to one wife and uh, that's the way they should live and, and that's there should be their sole intimacy um, is, is starting to be presented as like that person is somehow, you know, backwards uh, too much of a traditionalist and then of course that moves into being called an extremist and so forth. And the answer is, no, on the contrary, you don't have to feel defensive about this at all. On the contrary, you have to see that this is part of God Almighty's vision, that the civilization is based on a strong family unit. A man and a woman, that's it. They're, they're, all their interest and attention is focused inwards because then it becomes a productive energy that builds families and builds civilization. Um, let's look at a few of the comments over here. Uh, wow, that's fascinating. What's tough for me? I grew up with all this being normal. Yes, well, in, in today's society, um, there are so many human beings, uh, non-religious Jews, and the vast majority of non-Jews uh, grow up with either having, growing up in family situations where there's multiple series of men or multiple series of women um, for the parents, um, step parent relationships and all kinds of step uh, relationships. And then uh, in addition to that, there's all the the uh, reading of books from the, when the kids are kids and the movies they see and the cartoons. And um, and it just gets more and more extreme. But the, the underlying principles of the destruction of the family has already been laid from decades ago. It's not something that's just happening now. Um, so it is tough for you. It's tough for everybody. And it's tough for even those of us who grew up in, let's say, more um, families that were, um, you know, husband and wife, mother, but, but there's so many challenges. They were exposed to so many things and we could be exposed either because we go to we see things or we are just see them. You know, like today, you, if, if you have any exposure to television, any exposure to movies, go, you can go see a, a movie that you think is going to be um, really it looks like a decent movie. It has nothing really horrendous in it, but I'll just give you an example of immorality. So there's a movie called Raising Arizona. Raising Arizona is about a, a little kid that was raised. I don't remember all the details, but you hope, don't go watch it to find out the details, but you can, you know, something about a baby and parents raising the baby. Anyways, in, in the middle of this movie that has, it seems to be just such a sweet movie and cute, you know, slapstick comedy and all that kind of stuff. One guy turns to the other two married men and one guy turns to the other and he suddenly says something he makes a suggestion that uh, about wife swapping which is of course is forbidden because a woman that's married to a man cannot be together with another man so that's absolutely forbid forbidden for any human being so this guy suggests that they should swap wives so the the other man he gives this horrified like response that's disgusting it's horrible whatever he says over there and that's the end of the scene, and there's no more discussion. But what? Why was that script written like that? Because it's meant to be. You're, they're they're drawing you in for a relatively sweet story with some cute plot lines and so forth, and they just want to throw this idea out there for you to think about it. Now, and the, the more you hear about that, the more you see about it, the more you're going to read about it. And if you start reading other things, and people are talking, 
then all of a sudden it becomes like a societal normal thing that a person is saying, well, uh, why not? Uh, you know, like, that, but then they've, that's the demoralization because the person is losing sight of the fact that there is a divine set of commands which are meant to as guidelines to keep us on the path that is going to be the best for our well-being in the current world, in this world, the physical world, in the spiritual world, in as individuals, as families, and as communities, and as nations, and as humanity as a whole. So this is the infiltration of these ideas are, are just intended to, um, to break down those boundaries. So that in that Raising Arizona movie, the guy didn't say, let's go, um, you know, let's go rabbit hunting or let's go rob a bank. Okay, we got nothing to do this afternoon. Let's go rob a bank. Let's go slash some tires. That would not have been, that would not have advanced the, um, the normalization of immorality as it did by suggesting what they suggested. And then, of course, the shocked reaction is just part of, um, that's how they normalize things. First, there's all these shocked reactions like you see today. People are reacting in shock over what merchandise is being sold and all this kind of stuff like that. But just no one in the movement to normalize these things is in any way bothered by this. In fact, they are celebrating the fact that there's this uproar because this uproar is part of the normalization process. And then next year, it'll be less of a reaction. Next year, uh, it'll be less and less reaction. So, um, so this you grew up with all this the answers this is why this is why this is 23 says that human beings are going to flock to the upright jew who did not allow any of these influences into his life or if he was exposed to these things he returned to god almighty and he works to not dwell on these thoughts and not to act on these thoughts not to speak with these thoughts or these ideas so that is going to be, those people were going to become a magnet for humanity. That's the light into the nations. The light has not go on, gone out with the people who are responsible in carrying the Torah from generation to generation. So I see this with many people I learn with. They're coming from backgrounds. They're young, young men and women. They, they, the chaos, the, the relationship chaos in their lives, the, finance, the, the chaos in terms of um, immorality, theft, um, the association we have with other people that that are even sometimes involved in, in murder situations, you see that they they don't have exposure to a kind of like a stable. Well, this is where my father acted. I'm going to emulate my father and my mother. So that's why we have to teach. We have to teach the Torah. We have to tell the stories of the Torah. We have to tell the examples of what moral conduct looks like and what God Almighty's will for every person is. Um, so you're in the right place. Keep keep coming to learn. It's it's a lifetime process, and and it's we cannot be afraid of the thoughts that come into our head, because the thoughts that come into our head is is that we don't have control over it. We do have we do have the choice, however, what thoughts we're going to take seriously. And in a loving way, we need to reconnect ourselves to God Almighty and and help each other become more and more connected to God Almighty, knowing that whatever we think we're going to get in that temporary experience is minuscule to what we get from increasing our connection, increasing our contact with God Almighty, um, asking Him what He would have us be and how He would have us act, and asking Him for the courage and the power to be able to carry that out. That is what is is eternally rewarding and it comes with none of the side effects of the temporary experiences so we have to just reinforce each other with that and one of the things that i would love to do and if we can get you know more of um of these things going is something called the forbringen a forbringen is a little bit more of an instead of a class and more of a, like an informal gathering where we could just strengthen each other on some of these very very important um very important principles important things and just be able to talk about it in a more um heart to heart way so let's please speak up to help create opportunities for that um 
Next comment, this happens for women with modesty address. Young women buy what is most available to them. Yes, well, this is a tremendous thing. You're going to walk into a store and you're going to see what's available. And uh, the cut is like this. The skirt line is like that. The That's just, that's what's in style because it's become through the education system completely uh, marginalized and through the television, the media and so forth and movies, marginalized the, marginalized the idea of an older generation saying to younger generation, this is not proper dress. This is not proper conduct. This is not proper speech. So in order to accomplish this, that a girl will walk into the store and even be willing to, um, to buy something is because her parents have abdicated their responsibilities to say anything about it. And in many cases, the mother herself is wearing the same stuff probably go shopping together so they're everyone's everyone's like deteriorating in this and it becomes very very challenging and it, and it becomes very challenging to raise children and say we're not going to dress like that and that's why it's so important um i always tell people you know people say oh well you know uh, an upright jewish girl is not going to dress like that you know non-jewish girl on the street corner and i always tell them well one second that's that's not really the way to educate the jewish girl because she is going to be stuck in life with this choice. Well, there's a Jewish way and there's the not Jewish way. And then it's kind of like two options. And it's always, one's always pulling. Um, and, and especially when the society is going more in the direction of, of the way this non-Jewish, immodest way this non-Jewish girl is dressing, then it's going to become tempting. So what's missing over there in that way of speaking for the parent to speak that way is what's missing is that this Jewish parent is failing to see that the way that the non-Jewish woman is dressing is also improper. So he's saying, well, that's a non-Jewish way of conduct. No, no, no. That's an, also not a non-Jewish way of conduct. That's a no human being should be conducting themselves this way. And the way to educate our children is to say to them, that lady, you see the way she's dressing? That's not fitting for a non-Jewish lady either. And then follow that up by walking up to the non-Jewish lady and saying, excuse me, God Almighty created, as Rabbi Steif writes, that every, the, the glory of the king's daughter is meant to be internal. The beauty of a woman is meant to be something that's internal. It's not meant to be displayed on the street. So if you go up to her and tell her that and, and encourage her to improve her dress, then you're showing your own children that this is not about, we're not just merely, you know, trying to weather out the storm and trying to not be affected by all these um, seemingly um, easygoing, anything goes uh, things of the world. No, the way that the world, these demoralized ways of people's conduct and people's dress and so forth and the way that they speak, something that we need to be influencing them in every direction. So I want to encourage everyone to take that to heart also. I was watching this is that, Think about who you can speak to and say, my dear sister, daughter, I, I'm not, that's for your own sister's daughter also, but I'm saying but people, the, the girl next door, the girl down on the um, stoop of your building, the girl who is walking down the street, sitting next to you in the bus, you say, you know, you're creating God Almighty's divine image. And the, the verse in the Psalms, Kol Melech Panima, all the glory of the king's daughter is inwards applies to you. All this beauty that you have on dis display, God Almighty created that beauty. We're not we're not saying that there's anything wrong with the beauty. On the contrary, it's a creation of God Almighty. We're not going to deny its beauty. We're just saying that God Almighty is saying that that is meant to be something that's an internal expression. It's not meant to be on public display. And so you can have so much influence on so many people that way. And I just want to end on one of the points over here that Rabbi Steif brings that a husband's responsibility is to um, guide his wife and his children in these matters. And um, a husband should be encouraging his wife. So he writes in the, so I was looking up what he writes about the Satan, particularly in relation to the non-Jewish people in the, the, in the book that, the holy book that we learn on Sunday mornings. And he says over there that, um, and while he, he, as we concluded over here, the Sata procedure doesn't apply to, non-Jews, this um, testing of the suspected adulterers does not apply. That process is not um, a process available to non-Jews. However, the, all the prohibitions that underlie that, meaning there should not be that flirting and it should not be that um, uh, 
isolation between a man and a woman he's not married to, or a woman and a man she's not married to. Um, so that doesn't apply to non-Jews, but all the other concepts do apply. And he does right over there, and, and this he does say every Jewish man should be doing, but in understanding the context of it, we really could understand that it applied to every single human being because every man is responsible to dedicate his own family to the service of God Almighty. So he needs to speak to his wife and daughters about how they dress themselves. He needs to speak to them, make sure that in, in a loving way, and he emphasizes many times, we don't have time to go into the actual um, text of what he says over there, but in a, in a quiet way, in a gentle way, he needs to encourage his wife about her dress and her modesty, you know, that she shouldn't be, um, you know, spending time with men, um, and so too with his daughters, and of course the same thing would apply to his sons, that he should be encouraging them to also be moral in their conduct, and moral means not getting yourself into situations that's going to lead to immorality. So we have so much good to be able to accomplish, and I want to bless you all with that we should, you all, us, us together should have success in this, and that we should have, to, we, we, we need to make sure that we carry the message like we started at the beginning we're not looking at other people even though they're going so far from god almighty standards they're going so far from their own standards and the demoralization is being foisted on us by propagandizing foreign elements that seek to destroy um our country to seek to destroy our nation seek to destroy not only the jewish people as a nation seek god forbid seek to destroy america god forbid and and other countries by pushing in this immorality, distracting people, getting them into just frivolous uses of their productive energy. Um, while it can be tempting to write off all those people, God Almighty's approach for us and telling us through the Torah is, no, see every person for who they really are. They are one thought away from being connected to who they really are, which is created in God Almighty's divine image. See them that way, speak to them that way, and you'll have tremendous influence in bringing back thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and then billions of people to see that the warmth and the loving kindness in the ways of God Almighty and the ways of the Torah, and may we experience the complete fulfillment of that now with the coming of Mashiach and the, the righteous redemption of the entire world with the righteous Redeemer of Mashiach will be a time when every human being is going to be settled into the calmness and the tranquility of this knowledge and, and the conduct that goes with and flows from the tranquility and then contributes to even more tranquility. All right, God, bless, God Almighty bless everybody. Have a great evening. Just in terms of seeing your point over here, yes, just, just loving, loving words. The comment over here, yes, I'm trying to help, guide, and encourage my family to do the same. Some days it can be tough because my approach may be wrong, but I'm getting better. Always remember, it's a prohibition in the Torah to um, cause pain to another person with words. And this particularly applies to one's wife. And uh, it's a very, very severe consequence for a um, husband who causes pain to his wife through his words. Um, uh, no matter what a wife says, a husband cannot respond with her way of that that way of speaking that's that's a man is created by god almighty to be able to withstand that and uh not be flustered by that but he cannot um it's forbidden he's not allowed to speak any harsh words to his wife so it has to be with extreme loving patience it has to be extreme calm um it's this is a long-term process over here and we are talking about uh, people who are innocently misguided from decades of exposure to their own parents, to their own siblings, to the culture around them. And it has to be done with tremendous thick ropes of love to draw them close to God Almighty and to God and to show them that it has to be the love that they're going to experience and the experience from the relationship with God Almighty. And from, from in the case of a woman's dress, turning their beauty into the beauty it's meant to be as an inward beauty um, is going to be an even greater and more positive and thrilling and loving experience than what they think they're getting from from being open and exposed and um, that requires just a tremendous amount of, of loving patience and, and drawing them close so i want to bless you with success in that and um and just 
just consistently be positive and and, uh, and loving. Okay, beautiful. Keep out all the good work. God bless you all.